Tonight we begin a new series on Outlook. West Virginia isn't known as a state where a lot of scientific research is taking place, but there's a lot going on. Over the next year, we'll put this research under our own microscope in a series we call Lab 304. In this first installment, Mike Youngren learns about the Robert Seabird Telescope at the Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank. It's very beautiful here. The Greenbrier River wanders right along the bottom of Pocahontas County in eastern West Virginia. 480 million years ago, these mountains were taller than the Himalayas. 65 million years ago, about the time the dinosaurs disappeared, this place began to look like it does today. You'll see no unwanted television or hear no unwanted radio signals, no cell phones. There is no electronic fuzz to disturb the tranquility perfectly quiet, so that one of so inclined might hear the frequencies of galaxies and other worlds, matter and star stuff, and the sine waves made by organic molecules, the basic ingredient of life. This is one of the places they listen to the ancient sky and search for the beginning of meaning. Should I say that again? We're standing on the top of the receiver room of the Robert C. Byrd Green Bank Telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia. I can't even begin to describe what it's like to be standing on top of the Green Bank Telescope. The big one. Really big. Let me see if we can show you how big. We're about 400 feet above ground level right here and the telescope itself is about 480 feet depending upon its orientation. So it's taller than the Statue of Liberty and just under the Washington Monument. This is a one-of-a-kind machine. This is, a, this is designed specifically for a purpose and only basically one of them built, is that correct? It is, yes. This, it's the largest fully steerable radio telescope in the world uh, and it will probably be the last large single dish telescope built, at least in this country and, uh, and maybe in the world. Steerable means the Green Bank Telescope swivels and tilts. So how do you get 8,350 tons of steel to swivel like a prima ballerina? And it does that on uh, what we call trucks. There's a truck at each corner, so there are four of them. Each truck has four wheels. There's five foot diameter steel wheels. So with that weight, you've got 16 wheels. So each wheel carries more than a million pounds to the track and to the foundation below it. The foundation and the track was replaced this summer. Engineers designed a better, beefier circle of high strength steel. They welded and bolted it to a stronger foundation with real big bolts. Then they ground the track surface flat and level. Absolutely flat, absolutely level. The telescope can be aimed to a tolerance of one arc second. An arc second is the width of a human hair, six feet away. And at what was it aimed? Pulsars and quasars and magnetars, and spiral galaxies, hydrogen bubbles, and organic molecules, and nothing. Sometimes they aim it at nothing to see if it's really nothing. And sometimes they aim it at something that appears to be nothing. Do you get any radio frequencies that you don't get anything from a black hole, do you? You can't see anything directly actually emitted from the black hole itself but there's often a lot of stuff going on around the black hole. There's matter that's falling into the black hole and not, not everything that's falling in makes it in. In fact, only a small fraction 
of, uh, I mean, you can imagine that black holes, they're really big and they have a lot of gravitational pull, so gas and dust and, and stuff from a long way around is drawn to them and sort of starts orbiting and makes a big disk. And not, not all of that falls into the black hole. A lot, of it, a lot of it actually sort of gets swung around and squirted out. Nicely put, the space stuff they see, well, they hear it. Or at least they can measure it. But when you talk about looking at something a billion light years away, you know, that, that, that radio frequency, that radio wave has traveled to us at the speed of light. So we're also looking at a billion years ago, okay? So we're looking back in time, too. And that's one of the uh, fundamentals of cosmology is the ability of the astronomer to look as far away as possible, which also allows him to look as far back in time as possible to determine the origin of stars, the origin of galaxies, the origin of the things that we see in the night sky. It's very quiet here at Greenbank. When you're trying to discover the very beginning of everything, you need it to be very, very quiet. This story was produced as part of our series, Lab 304. You can learn more about it by going to our website, wvpubcast.org.